welcome to another edition of Active Living. We, today we have our wonderful traveler, Jim, <laughs> who's been traveling all over the world, has just returned from his latest trip from Iceland, and we're going to do a little uh, interview today with Jim and talk about his uh, trip to Iceland and what he found out up there. So tell us, why in the world did you pick Iceland as a place to go to, Jim? Oh, well, this is based on my traveling partner, Samantha. She kind of picks the areas that we're going to visit in the world. So uh, this was another area based on what she saw and what we believe would be fantastic, like glaciers and volcanoes and ice fields and uh, the scenery there, the waterfalls. I mean, just fantastic scenery in this small country, which was very pleasant to visit from the standpoint of the people. Really? And so where did you fly into? Well, we flew from New York to Keflavac, which is an international airport. Uh, they don't fly into Reykjavik because Reykjavik is more for domestic flights, but Keflavac is the international flight. Okay. Traveled from New York to uh, Iceland is about 4 hours and 40 minutes, so it's not that far, which is kind of neat, you know, and it's just below the Arctic Circle. And from a standpoint of Iceland, a few facts, it's uh, about the size of Ohio. It's about 340,000 people. About 120,000 live in the capital of uh, Reykjavik, and then about 200,000 in the whole metro area. So 60% of the population of Iceland live in and around Reykjavik. Wow. So it's so kind it's of a, interesting. It's a fairly yeah. small country then. Very small really country, small. yeah. <laughs> based on the size of Ohio, that's, I thought it was much larger than that, but it's not. And um, so we arrived there about 6.30 in the morning. We left New York about 8.30 and got there at 6.30. There's the four-hour difference between Eastern Standard Time and Who Iceland is there? Time. Okay. So we got there at 6.30, and then it was raining as usual. It almost rained every day. And then we took the 45-minute uh, bus drive into uh, Reykjavik. So it's a neat place to visit. Sounds like it. Yes. Now, how about the weather up there? Is it really cold up yeah, there? Yeah, well, it, it ranged from about 35 to about 55 every day. And okay. intermittently, it had rain during the daytime. There wasn't probably a sunny day that... Um, we had most of them were sunny, but we had rain every day, no matter what. Maybe for like 20 minutes, and then it would stop, and you go someplace else, it rain again. And but um, generally, it was pretty pretty clear most of the time. Other than no one snow. Yeah, we had snow one oh, evening. It had hail and snow, and I mean, and accumulated about two inches. That was about third third day into our trip, and that was uh, really a, a thing to see as far as hail and snow. Unbelievable. So it's kind of like Michigan in November, right? Probably, yeah, <laughs> probably. Yeah. So our first thing that we saw in as we. Um, Left the hotel about 9.30 in the morning. We went and walked down to downtown uh, uh, Reykjavik. We went to the first uh, building, which was the church. It's the Hallgrim Kriya. It was started in 1937. It took 38 years to build. It's a Lutheran church, and it uh, was just the tallest building probably in Iceland. It's about 244 feet high. Okay. And you have a, a view on the top. You can see the whole capital and some of the mountain ranges there. And um, it was designed, and like I say, took basically 38 years to build. So we didn't complete until almost, what was it, 19, uh, 38 years on to 37, about 1985, 75, I guess it is. Okay. And a uh, beautiful place to visit, a beautiful organ in there, the pulpit and such. It was really, it almost reminded me of Gaudi in Spain. The uh, columns inside were like trees. And okay. it, it was beautiful. It's an absolutely beautiful church. And in front of the church was Leif Erikson, one of the Viking um, um, explorers that came to Iceland. So he was in front of there. So it was kind of neat there. And uh, then we walked downtown and uh, saw a lot of the, t uh, the stores down there. There's probably hundreds of stores down there. Little boutique shops, really nice. And then on one of the streets, they had two large pictures or two large uh, figurines of the trolls. And trolls are very okay. significant in Iceland because they use this as a scare tactic for the children to behave. So if they said, if you don't behave, the trolls are going to get you. Oh, really? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but it's almost like the, the Icelandic said it was like a cock and bull story. You know, it's kind of just to keep the kids in straight, you know. So right, it's kind of interesting. Right, yeah. Right. So it, it was kind of neat there. And then um, then we had to go from the standpoint of there's a place called the Bajirens Bestu Pilsner. It's the best hot dogs in town. Typically, they think that it's like the people eat a lot of whale meat and such and shark. Right. They do, but the best thing is a hot dog that 90% of the people have eaten the Icelandic hot dogs. They're 90% lamb and 10% uh, pork and beef. And the neat thing about that is all organic food because they do not allow any live animals to be imported into Iceland. Oh, really? So it's all sheep gra uh, uh, grazed uh, meat, you know, basically the beef and the pork. And uh, it's just amazing how good it is. When you bite into it, it's really uh, snappy and such. And they also have a hot dog that's named after Clinton. It's called the Clinton hot dog. Oh. It's because it's, it's, he ate there at this place. Oh, is that right? It, yeah, it's a little place, no more than eight yeah. feet by eight feet. And this girl just pushing out hot dogs like you can't believe. And the lineup is continuous. I mean, all day long from about 10 o'clock until 2.30 in the morning on the weekdays. And they're open until 4.30 in the evening on the weekends because of the people who leave the bars. They come and have a hot dog. 
and you have to have more than one. We ate one first, and then we ate two of them, and it cost about three bucks a piece and about a buck and a half for a Coke. And it is unbelievable. And the condiments they put on everything, you want everything on it, and you get the onions, the mustard, and they called, uh, one of the things they had was the um, um, Romalde, I think they just made of capers and herbs and all that stuff they put on the hot dog. Wow. Very tasty, and it's, it's actually excellent. You can't beat it, I mean. For three bucks? For three bucks. And that's their typical meal they eat. A lot of times they'll eat that. And if you can get it any place in like your um, gas station and such, but this mm -hmm. place this woman had, it's been open since 1937, been, you know, just dishing out hot, hot dogs like you can't believe, and it's just wow. unbelievable. It's right in the harbor there, and it's something really to see. Um, and then um, from there, uh, we um, went to what we called, let me see, could I talk about this? The Phallological Museum, <laughs> you won't believe this, this is actually a penis museum of all the different <laughs> dolphins, whales, and men, and everything else that's in this museum here. It's phenomenal, it's unbelievable, it's something to see, it's worth <laughs> to see. Uh, you won't believe it, but everything's in these uh, jars and such, so it's quite a, quite a collection there. And it was passed down from a grandfather to the father, and the son now is, wor is, is actually running the business, so it's, it's kind of a neat place to visit. So, But something to see, <laughs> it's, it, never believe it would be in Iceland that you would see something like this. Um, then, uh, like the next day, we would tour the, uh, what they call in Reykjavik, the apartment buildings, the cathedral, the harbor. And one of the neat things in town there was the Hofdai House. This is where Reagan and Gorbachev met in 1986. And this is where that Gorbachev came in and says, well, if you, because of the IBM ballistic missiles and that, they figured there'd be world war. They figured there'd be right. time for these leaders to meet. And Gorbachev put on the table that you have to get rid of the SDI to Reagan. He says, no way, no how, and that broke up the meeting, and they didn't meet for a couple of years later when Gorbachev came to Washington, and then after that, you know, the wall came down in uh, 1989, so it was kind of the prelude to ending the uh, Cold War, basically. Really? So it was kind of neat, yeah. Was, they met in this house right on the harbor there. It's a white house, and it's a beautiful little villa, villa home there, so it was kind of neat. So that was good. And uh, then the afternoon, we went to what called the Blue Lagoon, and this is neat. This is where the geothermal springs Oh, they yeah. heat the, uh, the water. It runs between 102 to about 112 degrees. And it's cold outside, but you walk in there, just absolutely just so soothing. I mean, it's unbelievable. So it's, you guys went in, actually went in the springs? Oh, yeah, yeah. You go in there, you get your bathing suit on Is and it? such. Oh, yeah. And it was cold weather. You, walk, you take a shower and you walk out, and then it's cold, and you walk right into it, and it's just it's so soothing. They got the little waterfall there, and it pulsates on your back. And like I say, you put this white silica sand on you, and it's uh, very soothing. It exfoliates the body. and. It was really neat, so uh, both and Samantha and I really enjoyed that. That was really fantastic. Now don't they don't they heat up there with that geothermal? Uh, yes. The next day we actually went to a geothermal um, uh, yeah. a power plant, and that they have many of these in Sweden. And it was the one we went to had two turbines in there and four generators. It most of Iceland is uh, heated by nine percent of the geothermal right. springs and also electricity. Thought, yeah. So it's the cheapest uh, utilities they have in in Iceland. And uh, so it's uh, phenomenal. They're, they're all over Sweden. In fact, they have the aluminum plants are actually there because the power is so cheap. They import the bauxite to make the aluminum. It's so melted how, there. How do they create the electricity? Do they, do they from the steam. It comes from underground oh, from there, the and steam. then it steams okay. up there, and it, it drives the turbines, and the turbines generate you know, okay. the power, and it goes out to the homes. Okay, so it, it's all done with no... Uh, no external fuel at all? No, none whatsoever. It's all by the thermal springs, and they got these huge, like, say, turbines in there. Well, you got pictures of them there. You'll see that. And it's really uh, a really nice heat. You know, basically, it also provides heating for all the greenhouses okay. in Iceland to raise vegetables. Right. And we did buy some tomatoes, and that was later in the, in the uh, tour. We bought tomatoes right from the greenhouses where they were actually um, grown. So it was I bet they were neat. good. Oh, they were very tasty, <laughs> very tasty. It was really neat. So. So that was uh, kind of the, the, uh, the uh, geothermal uh, power plants. Uh, and then we went on to what we call the first waterfalls in Skogur. And it was very impressive, and they had a nice museum there. We went, we went underneath the falls. We actually went to the top and saw it coming over the, the rim there, almost like Niagara Falls. And it's just so pretty, you know, and so green there. It's unbelievable. Right. And just uh, so that was our first one as far as the, um, the falls was concerned. But I don't and, picture it as being green. Well, certain spots it is. A lot of places are where the lava is okay. you know, because of all the um, volcano action they had. A lot of it's black and lava fields. You'll see a lot of the streams going off from the lava areas there. Right. But certain areas of uh, Sweden, even Reykjavik, had a lot of trees there and such. Okay. So it was pretty good shape there as far as uh, 
uh, trees and such, but some in the hinterland is pretty <laughs> pretty barren. Right. And then, like I say, the harbor uh, cities, you know, there's not a whole lot of trees there, so because of the fishing villages that uh, mm -hmm. are there, so. Um, so that's really uh, the whole thing that um, with Sweden or Sweden with uh, Iceland, it's uh, it's barren and there's some trees. There's no doubt about well, that. Well, it, it sounds to me like it might be a little bit. I was I spent two years in Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. It sounds like some of the area there in Iceland would be almost the same, especially the areas around the sea. Yeah, oh, it's very similar. You yeah, got I mean, you know fairly high cliffs, yeah. and uh, you got some what they used to call the barrens, which is all kind of like a barren area mm -hmm. inland. Yeah, and that's and you'll see that. I mean, you'll see a lot of boats are actually like a little behind big, like say pillars of uh, like hills there, and or uh, rock formations there to protect them from the sea. There, so right. it is like a shelter area that they go to. So it's um, it's quite uh, quite scenic. Let's put it that way. You it just remind you, well, I love to live here because it's so quaint and so relaxed atmosphere. Mm -hmm. It's it's unreal. It's just just beautiful. I mean, they still have a lot of fishermen up there. Yeah, and there's mostly in the southern part. They have a lot of fisheries there, but uh, not so much in the northern part of Iceland. But the southern part, they have one city there that has a lot of the mostly the fishing villages that okay. come there. Yeah. yeah, the fishing boats and the fishing villages are in, mostly in the south part of it. It's kind of in the middle at the bottom there. That's where the fishing villages are. Yeah, well, we're we're kind of sitting on the dock there right now, mm -hmm. and you can see the fishing boats behind us, right? Oh yeah, yeah. That was uh, <laughs> one of the last parts of our visit there, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Yeah. So that's kind of neat. So, and then uh, right after that, we went to our first glacier. It was called the Solomheim Jokel, and it was really, really receding. It was a lot of dark ash in there and the black sand and lava, and it was really receding pretty quickly. And that particular day there, we went there. It rained pretty bad, but <laughs> we got soaking wet because we didn't bring our ponchos and that. Because it was nice and sunny as you're walking out there, coming back, it just the rain came down real quick. But the receding of that glacier was just phenomenal. So receding so fast, and uh, but the so black I would assume is probably from the, uh, the original lava from the, the volcano the action. The volcanoes, had. yeah. So just scraping down the mountains now and bringing that uh, lava with it, and it's okay. really dirty and black. The first one we went to, so, and from that you go to what they call the uh, the next town we went to was the. Uh, Renisjar. It's a beach and it had the black lava sand, which is this basically. You can see it's, it's a black sand right here. I left in the package here because I took a couple cups of the black sand here. It's a beautiful black beach and uh, very scenic there. And they have really some neat rock formations that are right against the seawall there. And a lot of the migratory birds live there. Now, the only thing we didn't see, we saw the uh, Arctic terns and other birds, but the puffins were not there. They had already migrated someplace okay. else because they're the colorful birds, right, right. but uh, they were not there. There was none there. So we saw a couple eagles there, and um, but beautiful area to walk on the beach. They're very realistic as far as the, and, um, the water coming up there and the backdrop of some of the formation of the rocks was just incredible how it's eroded the area. So pretty, pretty neat there. Now are most of the rocks there black, which would be uh, like a, a you know, some of the stuff that comes out of the volcanoes. Like yeah, the a lot of it was black, except some of them were the gray colored, okay? And okay. so we saw some kind of a brown ones that, because uh, uh, they had a lot of layers. It was kind of interesting, the layers of rocks that they, you saw in the uh, various parts of the island, they were different. Okay. Some were gray, some were kind of reddish, and some were just, you can't believe, just like they're piled up on each other, and how they form, formed, it's unbelievable. You can't imagine how it right. was done from the, and um, <laughs> it was just, it's just unusual to see different rock formations there. Um, and then from there, um, we went to what we call the, this is uh, kind of a hard word to pronounce, is Jokul Sarlan. It's the Glacial Luz, uh, Lagoon. This is where there's a huge glacier there, and there was many, many of the icebergs are starting to break off from the glacier. Okay. And we had an opportunity to go in these duck boats mm -hmm. that they have at the Wisconsin Dells, and they drive right into oh, the yeah, water. Oh, yeah, right, right. And you drive all around these different icebergs there. There were seals in there. and. Uh, floating around and many, many icebergs of different sizes and uh, some are real huge, they were higher than our boat basically. Mm -hmm. And you can see on some of the icebergs they had the black ash in there because right. of the volcano that happened in 2004, 2010. And you can see the black serrations within the, the iceberg itself and uh, so, but huge, they're very huge. And then in fact the fellow who was driving the boat, um, he actually took some iceberg from the water and he actually broke it off and gave it to us to eat. Okay. So we chewed it and it was pretty neat. So. Wow. So that was kind of interesting. And it was cold, I'll tell you, it's very cold there. And that lake was something like 800 feet deep that where the glaciers is breaking off into the water there before it actually 
basically goes out into the ocean. The icebergs okay. actually float underneath this bridge and goes out in the ocean there. So, Jim, we're going to take just a short little break right here, and we'll be back in just a few minutes. Prescription drug abuse is a national epidemic. The new in way to obtain drugs is through parents' or grandparents' medicine chests. Removing prescriptions from your cabinet is the best way to keep drugs out of the hands of our young people. We've got to work together to protect our teens, our seniors, and our environment. Clean out your medicine cabinet today. Please participate in Operation Medicine Cabinet and drop off your unwanted or expired prescriptions at one of our law enforcement drop-off sites in Oakland County. We can't ignore this situation anymore. We're back with the traveling man, Jim, <laughs> Jim Robeck, and uh, we're going to be talking a little bit more about Iceland. So, Jim, you got it, buddy. <laughs> okay, so, well, next after that was we went to what they called the Thingvellir National Park, and it was kind of a neat area there because it was one of the earliest places where uh, they call it this Skelaholt Cathedral. And this is where they had the first parliament where they decided all of the laws of the land were actually done in a circle there and they would meet once a year and these would be the laws for that particular year that they would abide by. Okay. And it was kind of interesting. Now the people that were there in the early years, were they mostly Icelandic people or who, who, where, where did they come from? Well, a lot of them came from, you know, the, um, the northern like Sweden and Norway and Denmark. And okay. uh, so Denmark was kind of the one that's most prevalent, but the interesting part of that, their language more attuned to the Norwegians. Okay. Not to Danish, but more to Norwegians. Okay. It was kind of interesting. I thought it would be Danish, but yeah. uh, but they've stopped rule there. Danish uh, vacated there, I think, in the early 30s, something like that. So okay. they became an independent country. And uh, interesting about this, uh, this area that we went to in the uh, National Park there, they had a rift where actually the earthquake had went through. There was a rift about six feet wide where actually you could still see the crack in the, oh, in really? the earth. Yeah, so this is where the earthquake went right through there, you know. So oh. it, was, it was kind of uh, scary, but at the same time, it was kind of interesting to see that. You could see a split of the land there. So it was very scenic in that particular area. How deep did it go? Uh, uh, best I could see it was about 13 or 14 feet. Okay. Yeah, and it was, it was about right. maybe six feet wide at certain places, up to three feet. And okay. it was pretty wide, although you could see it going for long distances there. And then the next area we went to was called Golfos Falls. And this had consisted of two waterfalls. The first was like 11 meters, which is about 33 feet. And the second one is go down, so it tears down to the second was 31 meters. And it uh, goes down into a gorge, which runs about two and a half miles, almost like a miniature Grand Canyon where the okay. water's cutting through and uh, it has a depth of about 220 feet from the top of the falls down to the bottom there. It's a very, very uh, scenic and beautiful area to visit there. I mean, just, they keep the area so clean and uh, good for the tourists. I mean, you go right up in the falls, there's very little safety nets there. I mean, just a little chain and that's it. So really? you'd be very careful, there's no question about that. And from there, I try to cover a lot of these points. We went to the Struker, which is the spouting springs where the geysers are. Okay. And we saw these geysers and one that erupts about every four minutes. Surprisingly, that steamboat is, in the United States, is the, the largest uh, uh, as far as the geyser reaches between 90 to 120 meters. Right. And the one in um, Iceland, they reach anywhere between 70 to 80 meters. And Old Faithful is number three. I thought Old Faithful was the largest. Okay. But the one in Steamboat, uh, I guess in Colorado, is the largest one. So, And we saw there was a little geyser that only ri rises about two feet, you know, but they're okay. bubbling all over the place as you're walking through the, the geyser field there. So. Now, this is warm water as well, right? Yeah, it's warm water, yeah. Okay. It is. It's very salty, you can see. And we, when it actually erupted and came down, you can see the swirling of the water going down like a big hole, you know. It was kind of, uh, okay. I got a picture of that. It was, very unique and see how that water, I don't know if it went clockwise or counterclockwise, I didn't know which, which way it went because and you know with some parts of the earth if it was clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, and then beyond that, then we went to through the, what we call a lot of the glacier fields. And this is like, like the night before it snowed and we saw the snow on the ground about two inches with the hail and such. So right. very scenic and it was all unpaved roads that we went through. Oh. Yeah, it was very, very scenic. And um, so from there, um, from those fields, then we went to what they call, uh, we stayed in a specific town there in Bornegas, I think it was, and this is where we had the hothouse tomatoes and such, and there was steam right there. We saw the steam um, um, coming from the ground there, which they used to you know, heat the, the greenhouses. Right, and right. It's very slick. Uh, then we went to what they call, an area called, uh, what do you call it? Snifusness, and this was a peninsula. <laughs> I mean, say that again, Jim. Snifusness. The way that, I'm <laughs> okay. sure they're going to butcher me and say that's not the way they, <laughs> they pronounce it in Iceland. Uh, a lot of good museums there, and what was beautiful about that, they had these scenic cliffs. They're almost like the Cliffs of Moher in, in Ireland. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Right. You know, just scenic was unbelievable. The rock formations and the balancing rocks and such, and you just really just something to see. And again, it was cold and windy, and uh, this is where. Um, 
we actually ate at a restaurant there. This woman opened up the restaurant just for us, and it only can hold like 24 people. And uh, we had a bowl of soup, I think, a lamb stew soup was like $18 oh, with, with some bread, and that's about it, and water. Wow. But it was very tasty, and it was a full, full meal. It was really nice. And um, then we had the opportunity to then go down to the, the beach, and this is where um, we locked on along the beach. They had these rocks, which are supposed to be pretty, uh, uh, supposed to be, uh, let's say, um, helpful to your health and such. And this whole beach was covered with these, all these particular rocks here. And what was noted about this, there was an uh, English trawler that actually sunk there and the iron from the various boat is still on the beaches there. So they will not disrupt it, they'll leave it there forever. Really? Perpetuity. They will not leave it there. And as we walked along the cliffs there, there was a rock formation in the water looked like a dragon or an alligator head. Okay. And it was really neat. I mean, you say, oh, that's an alligator, you know. It's, it was kind of interesting to see that. And, uh, and in, that, in that area also, within Iceland, they have a lot of these emergency homes that you can actually, as you're hiking through the country mm -hmm. you can sleep there it's like a shelter they had food in there and a bed and things really? of that nature yeah they're all located all over Iceland so if you want to trek and hike all the way through Iceland these are shelter places you can hold up in and nice. they're in orange and they're very visible and uh, just basics just to get out of the weather if yeah. need be there so that's really what uh, what they're there for and they're so do they have a lot of hikers there that, uh, that well, we didn't that? see much there while we were there so I don't okay. know if it's done in the winter time or more in the spring and summer but this was okay. at the end of the season we're, we're at the end of the season okay. when we went to Iceland so a lot of the places were closing the hotels all these things were starting to close down even this lady who had the restaurant we, they had to call her to open up just for us so okay. it was kind of interesting there so that was good and then so were you with a large group that our group was about 22 people okay so it was a very small group it was really nice and um, so it was worth her while to open the restaurant yeah it was i mean for 18 dollars <laughs> you know, or 18 and the beer, right? you know, whoever had beer you know like right. beer six seven dollars you know and so it was worthwhile for them sure so it was just at the end of the season there um and then from there, we went to what they call in uh, Helisander, which was a fishing, fishing village there where uh, they had an outdoor museum. You were able to walk and such. And this is the first opportunity. Well, the second opportunity, we were looking for to find the northern lights. Uh -oh. And they're very uh, skittish. You know, we went out one night in a bus. We, la we waited for about an hour or so, and it was so cold out there, we gave up, you know. <laughs> then we went to this town here in Helisander. And we went out one evening, we saw flashes of the northern lights. It was yeah. very faint, it was green, it was quick, and it came through, and you could see the columns coming through. It was kind of a greenish figure right. there. Right. And that was the only time we saw them. We were hoping to see them really flashing there. Okay. It's supposed to have been a season, but it didn't quite materialize. But at least we saw a glimmer of it, okay? Oh, so, yeah, that's good. But it was good, you know, so yeah. we at least saw uh, part of the northern lights there. Um, and then um, we went to what they call the area of, what well, they call it Dritvik. D-R-I-T-V-I-K, and once again, we walked along these beaches, which had the stones and the lava sand here, and uh, once again, on these beaches here, they had what they call a, um, your test your strength, and they had these large rocks that were out in a row. There's four rocks. They were like the 23 kilo, a 54, 100 kilo, okay. and 154 kilo, so you can see what your man strength was if you try to pick them up, so I, I was able to pick up the 23 kilo, which is about... 48 pounds, something like that. Right. Couldn't pick up the next one, which was about 108 pounds. Couldn't pick that son of a gun up. <laughs> so it's your strength, you know, all these Vikings know how strong they are. So they were to pick up these rocks and it was kind of neat that- uh, They didn't the have any handles on those rocks. No, they did and you had to get underneath <laughs> it. And you know, at my age with the bad back- Yeah, just, right. <laughs> I didn't even try to do the hunt. I tried, but it was just impossible. Just couldn't do it. So, right. so th that was kind of neat. They had them on the beach. There was a couple areas that we saw that where they had these rocks. Really? So yeah, it was kind of neat that um, they had them out there for people to try it out. So. Um, the nice thing about making these trails there, we saw a lot of what I call these mushrooms, and I would talk to the people and say, those are fun guys, so these are fun guys watching us <laughs> yeah. as we're walking the trail there, you know. So a lot of fun guy there. Right, right. So, but they were nice, there's a lot of beautiful ones, they had eyes on there and everything else, they were very, very uh, unique, very, okay. very unique, so. Um, and then we, uh, after that, we went to what they call this place, it was called the Bajarnar Huffin, it was a shark farm. <laughs> This oh, guy, really? yeah, this guy, he would take the sharks that they would catch for the fishermen, right. and they didn't want them, so they gave it to this guy, and he would process them. They were 800 pound, seven to 800 pound green sharks. Wow. And he would cut them up and put them in these big plastic bins and cure them there for like, I don't know, I think it was like three weeks, and then from there they had to hang them up in these barns like tobacco, right. and they would cure there for, I don't know, maybe another two months or something like that. So we had some there, he gave us little pieces of it, and we ate it when 
you ate it, you had to have a sh uh, shot of schnapps. So you had that because it was not that great tasting. Okay. Was it, uh, how about the schnapps now? Was this? Oh, that was good. Was this the hundred proof stuff? Oh, it was. Yeah, oh, yeah. Was? You, you felt it going down, okay. but it was very smooth and very good. So, okay. but you had to have well, the shark, schnapps. shark, shark and schnapps. Harsh, yeah, absolutely. It's like a tradition, like in mostly uh, the northern or northern areas like that. They say fish must swim in water. So when you eat fish, you got to drink some schnapps or some uh, okay. liquor. Yeah. So okay. that's the whole tradition, I guess. So, <laughs> so you get drunk pretty quickly if you eat a lot of this stuff here. So. Um, but they, uh, he processed them there, and he had a nice little business there, a nice little museum. He had a lot of artifacts in there, like uh, seals and foxes and a lot of nautical stuff there, and beautiful. And he was making money off that, so it was pretty good. Okay. It's the same thing with also another farmer who went to that, uh, experienced the uh, volcano, mm -hmm. and he had a nice museum there. We took and saw the video and such, and he survived it. His farm survived it. Okay. And they made a nice little living off of that. You know, they had some rocks there and some good pictures and such, but uh, they stayed it, and... Luckily, they survived. So there was a lot of people that were now, killed when during these, that time. When, when these volcanoes go off, did it, did it affect the cities that, a lot? Um, you know? They didn't say that, but I think it affected, because it's mostly toward the middle and toward the eastern part of the island, because okay. Reykjavik is on the western side. Okay, so it didn't. So it did, because, you know, normally the Wesleys would push it right. the other way, so it wouldn't really come to Reykjavik. So they were pretty lucky. Yeah, they were very lucky, yeah. So, um, but those farmers and such that lived in the area there, they were, it's a little scary, let's put it that way, because oh, that yeah. bolt of stuff was coming out was pretty, uh, pretty interesting. And uh, so he had some nice pictures there and a good video to see what happened. Oh, he did? Oh, yeah, and, the, you know, the amount of ash that was on his implements and farmland and such. So, but it was pretty... Pretty significant what they went through, and uh, I believe it. They were nice people. They're really uh, very interesting, and they were very hospitable. I mean, they just treat us very well. Most of the people in in Iceland treated us very well. I had no issue whatsoever. Um, so then from there we went to uh, an area where they had a black church. It was all black wood and such, and it was kind of on the coast there. And they had these d uh, dugout areas that people actually had shelter when they came off the sea. They would go into the uh, part and then uh, house themselves. And the last thing would be the village of Steichlomer. This is where we went on the boat. We uh, went out in the fjord there, and we dug the bottom of the river, and we got some scallops, and we ate them fresh out of the shells. And that wow. was fantastic. And the last <laughs> thing we did was we had dinner that night at the revolving restaurant in Reykjavik, and that was the end of the trip, which then was you're fantastic. Then you're off to, off to the United States again. Back again. So. What's your next trip going to look like, Jim? <laughs> it's going to be very. <laughs> hey, what's it coming up, by the it's way? It's coming out this Sunday. We're going to Laos. Oh my with God! With Samantha and I, really? we're going to Laos to see her village and see where she was born. She hasn't been. Well, she came there when she was about three or four years old. She's been about thirty-seven years since she's going to. She's your traveling there. companion. Yes. So we're going to go there, leaving on Sundays for twenty-three days. So it's going to be an interesting uh, part of our trip to go into the back w tribal areas and see what's going on. Sounds like you spend more time traveling than you do at home. That's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Rolling Stone gathers no moss, right? Boy, you got that right. <laughs> so it's great to visit these countries. This will be really interesting because we're going to be it's unescorted, so it's all on our own. Oh, is it really? Yeah, so we're all on our own to do all the uh, accommodations, the buses, and whatever you have to have. You know, so okay. it's all going to be done by ourselves. Well, Jim, we want to thank you very much for joining us today. You've been very, very interesting. Uh, it sounds like you had a great trip. We did. And. Uh, we're looking forward to your next report <laughs> okay. uh, from Laos. All right, so that'll be good. So, so. Well, but thanks for joining us again. You're welcome. And thank you for uh, having us, you know, coming into the studio today. Love to do it. All right, bye now.